Good morning, Irene Matz from Cal State Fullerton. Welcome to the third annual Leadership Conference. We are so excited and thrilled to have everyone here today. This morning, people will be talking about ethics in the organization, recruitment and retention, and also we'll be talking about Gen Y and how do you deal with people who are from that generation. It is our honor to have you here today. We will have community people and also folks from the university. So welcome on the 4th of May 2012 to the third annual Leadership Conference. Thank you. Thank you to the third annual uh, Leadership Conference uh, of the Center for Leadership, uh, brought to you by the Mahalo College of Business and Economics, the uh, College of Communications, our faculty associates, and our advisory board. Uh, we're really pleased to, to see such a nice such a nice turnout at our first conference that's been dedicated specifically to uh, business managers and executives in the Orange County area. So we thank you for, for being a part of it, and we look forward to a, a really great day together this year. The first theme was proactive ethics. How can we as organizations uh, operate in a strategic way, operate in a thoughtful way, in a proactive way, so that we are making ethical decisions long before we're faced with ethical dilemmas. We've got a great line, uh, a great lineup of speakers in each of these areas. We have three folks that will be speaking to you on the in the area of proactive ethics, and we're going to have that board. Uh, that, that panel uh, will go first. That panel will consist of, of Russell Williams, um, of Ian can't pronounce his Diorio, last name. Diorio and, and Bill Sanderson, who will be joining us um, in just in time. Um, in fact, <laughs> Bill, it's, it's, actually perfect, it's actually perfect for Bill because part of his area is su supply, supply chain um, work. And so he's going to be showing us firsthand the, how the supply chain will work because he's going to arrive at, at the precise moment when it will be his turn on the microphone. So we will see, we will see just how precise and, and, and talented he, he is in that area. Uh, we're going to, the way that the sessions will be, it will all take place here at the front. We'll try to take a short break between each session, which will give us a chance to, to freshen up coffee and, and, and snacks and things. Uh, the, the restroom facilities are right outside the door here, uh, so everything's really close by. Ian's going to go first, and, and um, so I'll go ahead and, and step out of the way, and then you can transition to each person as we go. Okay, sounds good. Great. PowerPoint. Well, it's good to be with you guys. I actually am a pastor, and I spend the vast majority of my time speaking to uh, literally thousands of young adults a year, and I just want to let you know, young adults want to talk about three things. Sex the end times, and will there be sex in the end times? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I just want to let you know, I'm not going to be talking about any of those three things this morning. Uh, no conversations of sex in the end times, or will there be sex in the end times. But I do want to have a discussion about uh, the ethical impulse and the leadership kind of modalities of the Generation Y generation. These are people roughly born between 1980 to the year 2000. 70 million of them are now going to be booming into jobs, and they are called the Y generation. And I underlined in my talk the Y generation question mark because I think they are a generation who are asking deep and provocative questions about every area of life because they're so saturated with media and information that they're really a journey of self-discovery, that they're trying to figure out who they are why they are, and there's some ethical problems with that, but there's also some great opportunity to do with that. So I want to start off with a view of what's it like in the day of a life of the millennial. Well, just imagine, I work with college students and young adults. Imagine Jonathan. Jonathan's a sophomore at Cal State Fullerton. He gets up, he has his latte, and he thinks the world needs to know about this, so he takes a picture of it. <laughs> He takes a picture of his latte and then he sends it out on his Twitter feed and then there's Sarah who says, you had a latte too? And she retweets his latte to her 499 followers. 
And then he checks his Facebook account to see kind of what events and updates are going on. Then he hops on his MySpace. Then he gets on his LinkedIn just to pretend like he's somewhat of a professional. <laughs> and then he thinks about his class schedule. And then he turns on his iPod, which is connected to his iPhone, which is connected to his email, which is connected to his Twitter and his Facebook to show off what he's going to have for lunch that day. So it's going to be a real exciting day for Jonathan. Well, uh, uh, we know uh, as we look at the uh, growth of technology within our world, you see two factors really taking place within technology. You see this massive explosion of the mediaization of our world, that everything that you can do, you are a personal product that you can now show off to the world, which is a lot of responsibility for people in this generation. They feel an impulse to share their deepest moments, their feelings, their status updates, what they're doing with the world of onlooking followers, some that they know and some that they do not know. But the bad part about that is that they have a form of media saturation that they don't know how to get out of. Meaning, the average millennial, and this is a crazy statistic, when you combine the combination of multimedia uses, spends about 10 to 12 hours a day using some form of online digital or video media. 10 to 12 hours of digital via media a day. Now, just think about that in terms of cognitive mapping and shaping. Just think about it in terms of cognitive mapping and shaping. If you wanted to ask the question, what's shaping the moral ethos of a generation? What's shaping the futuristic views of a culture? It is what has the most exposure and gets them quickly. And the way that it gets to them is through YouTube clips, Twitter updates, Facebook accounts, Instagram. There are so many different ways. Now there's this website called Pinterest. Has anyone ever heard of Pinterest? Basically what you do is just like the things that you see on the web and you think, well, other people need to see the things that I like on the web. So there's this mass culture of information sharing that saturates the mind. In fact, what psychologists call adonia, which is this idea that people now are being so overly saturated that they're having trouble sustaining pleasure in life, which I think is an ethical problem because they're so overwhelmed with life. So if I were to describe uh, this generation in two words, I would really describe them as uncertain and overwhelmed. I would describe them as uncertain and overwhelmed for a few reasons. I don't know if you can read this, but on that left picture it says this. Today a person is subjected to more new information in, in a day than a person in the Middle Ages was in his entire life. So in one day, because of an iPhone or a, a you know, whatever other kind of lesser devices you use. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> obviously I have my uh, own desires about the Mac product. So I, I work with young adults and I really, what I see is this, there's this mass intake of information. They're overwhelmed with the possibilities of life. And it creates in them this information overload that makes decisions very difficult. Even the most modest decisions. So I work with young adults both on a collegiate level and on a ministerial level. What they are constantly seeking out is advice over the most mundane things. Twitter feed update, where should I go to lunch? Answer, I don't care, pick one. <laughs> but one of the reasons is they're so overwhelmed with so many choices. So I had a friend who's a missionary, who's a missionary in kind of what used to be you know, the USSR, so a kind of small country over in that area. And when he came back, he came to California and he went to the grocery store and he went down the grocery line and he was overwhelmed and he said he stood in the grocery line where the cereal was at, it was at for 45 minutes and he just looked around 45 minutes had no idea which cereal to choose because where he was from the former Eastern Bloc had like one cereal that you can choose from that will add and continue so that there's this movement of mass exposure which causes people to be uncertain about their career choices uncertain about relationship choices you might know that the average age for marriage now among the millennial generation for men it's 29 and a half for women it's moved up to 27. that's a five-year jump in 25 years in europe it's even further well one of the why we have to ask the question why would that be well because there's so many options out there, aren't there? There's not even options of cereal, but there's human options. So you look on your Facebook and you think, I have 4,000 friends, half of which are single. This is gonna be a tough one. <laughs> so, that, so people are actually postponing marriage. Another reason is that they're uncertain is, we all know, as it was mentioned earlier, the unstable economic climate that we live in. 
So people don't know which careers to jump in because what used to be the stable careers that you would get in to have the stable middle class jobs have now disappeared. So Daniel Pink is really famous on this, that those jobs that are basic on automation, that are based on routine and repetition are disappearing and will continually disappear from our culture. Well, what does that mean? Law, accounting, economics, things like that that used to be these stable middle class jobs that you would go into now are being automated, replacing the human mind. Software is replacing the human mind where industry replaced the human back. And so people are really, really confused. So what they do is they go to school. Statistically, 75% of the people who graduate from Cal State Fullerton will not have a career within the job, within the field that they study at Cal State Fullerton for two years. Uh, which I, as an academic, what I want to say is that's a huge problem for those of us who actually care about education. Secondly, it proposes uh, getting a career, because now people think I gotta go to more education because I'm uncertain about the economic market, so I better go get a graduate degree, maybe get a doctorate after that. So there's this huge sense of uncertainty out there based on there being so many options in terms of what you can do in your life path and your career path. I mean, just think about the way that your parents or grandparents thought about their careers or ethical choices. How many was there to choose from? I mean, you got one job, maybe two in your lifetime. You stayed with General Electric for 30 years. You knew your path. Now, the average span of careers in terms of uh, wise is going to six or seven different careers in their lifetime. And not just jobs that you look at. I'm talking career changes mid-life. So for 10 years, I was a business person. Then I really felt I need to get in touch with my inner child, so I'm going to go study psychology. And then I'm going to go be a psychologist for 10 years. And then I really want to build stuff. I'll be a civil engineer that there's this mass diffuse understanding of how you should live your life based on the incredible amount of options. So people that I come across in my own line of work, both as a pastor, working with people in ministry, is that they're overwhelmed, they're uncertain, they're confused, they don't know what to make choices with. Well, that might point out some ethical problems, right? Because ethics come out of a clear sense of your purpose. The word ethics comes from the Greek word ethos. Ethos refers to that center of yourself those guiding universal principles that ground who you are, that form your very identity, <coughs> right? This is your ethos. Maybe you even have an ethos or mission statement with your company. Well, in a world that is so spreading apart as quickly as we can, with so many options, people are having trouble locating their ethos. So how do these people make ethical decisions? Because we're gonna talk about ethics today. Well, I think that they make ethical decisions by two ways. One is via emotivism. Now that's a philosophical word that we don't need to really worry too much about, but basically what emotivism means is that ethics is not a reflection of a true proposition, but ethics are a reflection of your feelings. I'll repeat that. Ethics are not a reflection of a true proposition. Ethics are a reflection of your feelings. So right and wrong are relative to personal experience rather than being an objective standard of right and wrong, okay? Aristotle didn't think that way. In the Nicomachean Ethics, he said there are some things that are wrong, and there are some things that are right. They're universal like God, right? Well, now, because of this world of options to choose from, because we have pluralism, which is a good thing, you have lots of different cultures, people that make ethical decisions coming from lots of different perspectives, what is true north for a millennial in terms of making an ethical decision? Where do they go to? Well, say I wanna Google. Ethics. How do I make an ethical decision? What should I do in this situation? What I'm going to find when I Google that is 15,000 different articles on Wikipedia. How do you make a choice? What you need to be is an expert in everything, which means you become an expert in nothing. And so how do people make uh, ethical decisions? The vast majority of the time, young people, Generation Y millennials make ethical decisions is based on intuitive feelings. Okay, intuitive feeling. So that the way they look at the world is not that there's these objective stances of right and wrong. They believe there's right and wrong, but what they believe right and wrong reflect are the individual feelings of individual people who therefore have particular views and uh, feelings about certain things. So you want to respect somebody's view, which is very good. Tolerance is a good thing, but not because there's such thing as truth in terms of ethics that we need to watch out for but because you don't want to hurt that person's feelings, right? I mean, this is a culture where you don't have losers anymore, you have last winners. 
<laughs> the least best. Right, the least best, right? Everyone wins. Everyone wins. Well, ask yourself, well, that's an ethical dilemma, isn't it? I mean, one of the reasons it's an ethical dilemma is you don't want to make anybody emotively, intuitively, emotionally feel like they've lost. Well, now let's unpack that just for a second. Like, I mean, I'm the oldest of the millennial generation, so I still got a little bit of that kind of like butt kicking old school type of like, you, you lost and deal with it. Some of you are a little bit older than me and you know exactly what I'm talking about. Well, it's because your parents or your grandparents had a standard by which they actually could judge whether or not your action was a loss or a win. Is that true? Well, nowadays, where is that standard? Well, the standard is your intuition. And so when I see Sally and she's crying because she was the last winner, how do I deal with her? Well, I emotively deal with her and try to build her up, self-esteem culture, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, to make her feel emotively, intuitively good about herself because we have no real clear understanding of what right or wrong is. Now, just think about your businesses when it comes to that. Say you're a, a corporate executive and you have a bunch of millennials working under you. When you ask them to do something, that you think is ethically clear, they're gonna be making that choice and how faithfully they obey that based on how good it makes them feel. The vast majority of how good it makes them feel. It's gonna be intuition, okay, intuition, because they're unclear, so they really don't know. There's so many options out there. We live in a Google verse, so you go on and you go, oh my gosh, what's going on here? And so you have to trust one thing and they, it basically comes down to what's my internal feeling. Second is individualism. Uh, we're Americans, individualism is part of our culture. This generation is no less individualistic. People think they are because people think, oh, they're more, more socially progressive. We're gonna talk about that. They are more socially progressive. They're the civic generation. They think in terms of collective, but it's not because they think the collective is most important, but because they believe that every individual should be able to feel good about themselves. Because the individual is absolutely sovereign. So you want to create a society where nobody has this feeling of feeling left out. Therefore, it's hyper-individualism. It's not that one per collectivism says one person can be left out for the good of the whole. Hyper-individualism says let's build a society so every single person can actually have a manifest destiny, feel better about themselves, be guided by something that's beautiful and true. So you, this is the generation that elected Barack Obama. Why? Change now. right? They wanted something different now. I'm not saying that was a bad thing either. Just Trying to point out some things. So if you look at the bottom, there's a picture that says good, evil, and then you see on the bottom it says relative morality. Most millennials are what are called social constructivists, meaning they believe that, again, good and evil, right and wrong, are subjective feelings that we place upon the universe based on our relative social location. Does that make sense, right? So what's good for you is good for you, what's bad for me is bad for me, but what's bad for me might not be bad for you, so therefore let's all go hang out and take pictures of our food and put her in. <laughs> okay. that, that's, that's, that's the flow in terms of how they make ethical decisions. Now, I, I just gotta be honest where I come from. I, I do think there are standards of, of right and wrong. I think there are ethics, right? And uh, I'm informed by my, my faith, but I'm also informed by I think reason and logic and, and that there are some things that are just really wrong. Now, I'm not saying I have the absolute access to that, but I do wanna have a conversation as a leader within both an educational setting and a church setting that there should be a true north to our souls and that we should not give up on looking for and searching for an ethics and ethos to guide us, that we should think about our emotions in light of what we would call truth rather than our truth in light of our emotions. Does that, that make sense? So uh, here's an example of the ethical demonstration of this generation. How many of you saw the Coney 2012 uh, go crazy? Does everybody know what I'm talking about? So uh, Invisible Children is an organization that's dedicated to eradicating Joseph Kony's regime, which takes uh, child soldiers and, and puts them to war, a very atrocious, evil organization. Well, there was a lot of conversation about the Kony 2012. There's a 28 minute video made to try to make him famous. Because what the Jason Russell and some of the people from Invisible Children, they said, nobody really knows this story. They don't know this guy. So how do we make him famous to mobilize people to action? What tool did they use to start a movement? Media. They started with media. They didn't call a congressperson. They didn't meet with senators. 
They didn't get a meeting with Barack Obama. What they did was they did a 28 minute film and they put it on YouTube and it went viral in seconds. Now, here's the question I have. Is this generation activistic in terms of their ethical stance or what I call clicktivistic, clicktivism? <laughs> what I mean by that is, so what would happen is this Coney video went online and it went viral and if anyone's on Facebook here, like who's not, right? Like if most of us are on Facebook here, you can like things so you have a whole generation of people who are driven to see this as an ethical cause. And why? Where did, what part of their life did it hit them and speak to them? Their emotions. They saw pictures. It spoke to their individuality. I would hate if that happened to me. I can't believe something like that's going on. And it used the power of media to actually mobilize millions of people. They raised millions of dollars within a period of a few weeks. And people were clicking and sharing and showing on YouTube and Twitter this huge ethical cause. Now, I think that's a, a, there's a good part to that, but there also needs to be, there's a, there's a bad part to that, and the bad part is this. Because we're so overwhelmed with media saturation, because there's a motivism as the guiding ethical principle of a generation, whoever can make the most cool, relevant video to support their cause, regardless of what the cause ethical stance really is, wins. And a word that we would have for that is propaganda. I'm not calling prop this propaganda, but what I am saying is a world that's raised on 10 to 12 hours of media saturation a day can be easily manipulated to buy into causes based on the production of a media saturated venue. So, and Jason Russell, who I've met and I know, knows that. Now, uh, Coney, regard, I'm not talking about the cause, but you see the other slide here. And what it says is, watch a 38 minute video on the internet, become a social activist. Well, that came out right after the Coney video came out because there was a whole group of people who said, do these people really, really care? Are they really engaged? Are they really involved? Do they really care about the ethical uh, situation going on? Or is it this idea that I want to click and therefore I've clicked and therefore now I'm an ethical creature and I know about that and I'm informed of what's going on in the world and there's really not participation. What I want to say is that this generation is some generation, their generation wants to change the world. They're activistic, but what they need is people who have a clarity of all the social, political, geographic, economic issues that go behind an organization or an issue to walk with them, or they can be easily manipulated just to buy into whatever the best looking video is at the time. So that's one of the issues I think is with this generation because they don't have that centered ethos. They can be easily drawn into things uh, based on how well produced they are. Well, this generation is thinking about economics differently uh, than other generations, and it comes out of the ethos. Now, again, some people think that all the millennials are kind of like closet socialists. It's not true. Uh, but they are what I call cause-based capitalists. What I mean by that is this. This generation is going to radically uh, generate new forms of capitalism. They're going to change the way economics work. They're going to change the way economics work. What I mean by that is because they believe, based on media saturation, based on emotivism, I want to feel good, I know somebody else out there doesn't feel good, how can my choices make somebody else feel good? I don't want to change the way I live, but I want to make sure the way I live affects a positive change in somebody else's life. There's organizations now are looking at capitalism, basic human needs, economic needs, physical needs, things that we all buy into, and how can we change those so that we can actually grow a better world. Tom Shoes is a great example of that. Does everybody know Tom Shoes? Well, Tom Shoes uh, started his organization with a simple philosophy, a one-for-one -one philosophy, okay? That is a millennial company. So when you think about ethics in terms of economics, in terms of the millennial's view of eth ethics and economics, being a proactive ethical economic business, this is your future. Incorporate part of what you do for the betterment of the world because it's going to attract millennials to you because I'm going to show you a few slides in a bit. Uh, money for millennials is not the type priority. What? How is that possible? But And what you're going to see is you're going to have corporations and companies started over and over again by people who say, we will take less to give more. I was with uh, the CEO of Daytron World Communications, a $600 million company. Uh, out in Vista, California last week having a conversation about uh, a startup I'm doing. And as I walked into the company, 
they have a wall, they call it their wall of fame. And what it is, is all the letters and pictures they get from people that their company supports because their company gives 10% of its gross revenue away a year to 501c3s. That's $20 million a year that's giving away. Two, two. They, they build radios for healthcare equipment for the military. But Art Barter, the president of that company, who uh, realized servant-based leadership, that if you want to attract the best players, you need to have a centerpiece of ethics that really guides people in their decisions. So the employees actually delegate where the money goes. So you're just going to see that. Well, that, well why? Because this generation is thinking in terms of emotion. They know, they're like, I wouldn't want to have, like, not have shoes, but I can get a pair of shoes. And if I can get a pair of shoes, they get somebody else a pair of shoes versus me getting a pair of shoes that doesn't, which one am I going to choose? So that, that's the game in the future when it comes to economics. Well, work life among the millennials. Now, you're going to have one of the world's experts in this uh, talking later, so I'm maybe speaking out of turn. But I do think there's an impression of the millennials that I want to say is uh, not true. And that impression is here on the left. They're young, they're cool, and they don't like to go to work before 10. <laughs> so that's, that's part of the impression of the millennials, is that they're people who, because they're so feeling, they're so feeling based. I have some of my students in my ministry here, so I don't know if they'll agree to that statement, but they're laughing, so I think they do. Uh, and so, uh, but I do think there's this impression, right? Especially the older generation, because you have what was called the Protestant work ethic, work ethic, which framed American economics, right? Which is how you validate your life by the amount of hours that you put in. Does that make sense? That is not how millennials think. I, as the oldest millennial, I just want you know that's not how I think. I don't think of my job in terms of amount of hours I put out, but in the amount of significance I spend in those hours. So companies are moving to what's called the row, results only work. You guys ever heard of the row? So there's certain corporations that are starting the row based on millennials. Millennials, because millennials are demanding a row. The row says this, do your work where you can, when you can, on your own time, don't come to the office, come into the office, just get your work done, be part of what we do. Google is famous for starting what's called Google time. Google time is one day of the week, or I think it's one every two weeks now, that you can come and you get a day off to do whatever you want. Go where you want, be what you want, think about what you want. The only requirement is 24 hours when you come back to work, there's going to be this cool meeting with coffee and like glow sticks and you know like disco balls. And you're, you're going to share what you thought of and dreamt of while you were on Google time. Google Plus, Google Mail, Google Earth, all came out of Google Time. So if you look at this slide, and I have it on my here, in terms of on the right, how they break down, thinking about work and personal life balance, my personal life is a priority, and I spend most of my years would say that's the case. That that what they want is just my life, I want to live my own life, that's not the case. Secondly, I have an equal balance of my work and personal life. That's 46% of millennials. The vast majority of millennials want an equal balance between what they do. Again, I spend a more time at work, but have some personal lifetime. That's 38%. Always at work, 6%. So what you can say is, these people don't live to work, they work to live. But it's not that they don't care about work, but here's the deal. They care about work that is emotively significant and allows, what do you think? Their individuality. Okay? They care about work that touches their soul and their wallet and allows them to express their individuality. And so if you're a manager in here, if you're a student, you're a boss, as you think about hiring millennials, we'll have a conversation about that later, what you need to know is those are the factors that they're looking for. Can I, I mean, can you imagine saying that to your grandparents? Like you leave a high paying job because you go to a new one because it lets you express more of yourself. Oh, grandpa, I can really fully express myself in this job, you know? It pays me 30 grand less a year. He's like, are you an idiot? Uh, but that's what you're dealing with because people want to express what they feel and their individuality. <laughs> Uh, their priorities. I think this is probably one of the most actually satisfying things about the millennials. Uh, if you look at their priorities, and I think this is in terms of, uh, we can think of this in terms of proactive ethics as well, 52% of them say being a good parent is their highest priority. Isn't that an interesting thing? Especially when they're not getting married until their late 20s and 30s. Can I tell you what's happening there? They're so afraid of not being a good parent that they're putting it off. <laughs> they want to make sure they've read all Dr. Phil and they're on own as much as they can so that they can be a good parent. Secondly, have a successful marriage at uh, 30%. Well, why? 
this is the generation that saw more divorces the generation before in American history than any other time. So uh, I can speak to that. I, my mom's on number three. Don't mean that judgmentally. But when I got married, I, I made sure that this was going to work. That was a high priority for me. I, this speaks for me. Third, helping others in need, 21%. Notice the correlation between the first three. They're all relational. They're all relational. You only, to the next one, get things that are economic or material. Owning a home, 20%. Living a very religious life, only 15%. One of the interesting things about this generation is it's actually one of the most highly activistic generations in American history. It's set to be the greatest of the greatest generation is what some people are calling it, but it's actually very uh, non-religious. So for my line of business, that's kind of a tough one to think about. But hey, so for you guys, the next one, same amount of percent people care about uh, religious life is a high paying career. Isn't that interesting? I just, let me just ponder that as we think about ethics. Only 15% of millennials, of that 70 million group, when they think about their life, 15% of them say high paying career is what they want. 52% of them said that they want to be good parents and have great marriages. I, that is the ethical center of, of this generation. So I, I just think as we think about uh, how we go about work, again, having lots of free time, 9%, becoming famous, again, that's not a huge concern uh, of theirs as well. Here is a great slide. What millennials want uh, from their bosses, the type of, top five ca ca characteristics that they want from a boss. One is that they will help navigate my career path. Two will give me insight and feedback. Three will mentor and coach me. Four will sponsor uh, formal development programs. Five is comfortable with flexible schedules. Obviously, right? They don't want to come into work before 10. What do they want from companies? One, that they'll develop their skills for the future. The company has strong values. It offers customizable options and benefits and award packages allows me time to blend uh, work with the rest of my life, offers a clear career path. Again, to learn top five things millennials want to learn, technical skills in my area of expertise, self-management, personal productivity, leadership, industry or functional knowledge, creativity and innovative strategies. So if you think about hiring millennials, those are some things that they're looking for in terms of going. And as I show you, because of their ethics, you can see emotivism and individualism in all of those categories. Lastly, um, Leading ahead, what I think we need to do uh, as leaders and as business owners and future business owners and future business leaders and leaders in our community is we need to change the face of mentoring. Uh, this is, I think, one of my goals of my life. I've coined two terms. I, I'm, uh, one is mentorbate and the other is mentorvation. I want to combine the art of motivation and innovation with mentorship because I think that's the most strategic way to change culture. Three out of four millennials say what they want more than a higher paying strategy is a personal mentor. Go back to what I said earlier. We live in a very confusing world. They want somebody to come alongside of them and walk with them, okay? The more that you can give that to them within your economic, your business stance, whatever you do in terms of your career, the better output you'll have for them because they think through relational terms. So, I, so one of the things I'm doing right now, I'd be happy to talk personally with you about it is I'm trying to start a mentor revolution via, via the net using social media, and I'm working on that with some business partners right now because I believe that this generation should have the greatest impact if they are guided rightly, if they're given an ethical center, if they're work and intergenerationally connected, that we really can change the world and change the face of ethics. Thanks so much. So how many of you feel stimulated? <laughs> yeah. How many of you feel overwhelmed? How many of you feel old? <laughs> uh, my hair is naturally black, but I gray it to look uh, <laughs> So you heard the story about what's coming. Let's talk about the story of you. And I've been charged with the explanation of our role about the individual. And to look at the fact of who we are in this tidal wave of change that Ian has revealed to us. And to find our place is what Ian has called us into possibility with, with his last comments. He's saying that where we are going is not only a sea, 
a, a change that we don't even understand fully, but we need accompaniment to get us somewhere. So let me take you into you purposefully. Let me affirm something about what your work is. And to call into accountability your responsibility to not be overwhelmed, but to take charge of a journey that by the year 2015, this generation is going to be in place big time. And you're going to be there to move them along the way. I want to take you back to 2009 to set the stage for what I'd like to share with you about the four lessons of, le of living and leading on the ethical edge. I go back to 2009, and I was about ready to jump into 25 conversations, presentations to Rotary Clubs throughout Orange County about what it means to be an influence for good in a society that's facing a lot of ethical craziness. And so at these, uh, at these uh, Rotary meetings, I would come in and I'd sit down and uh, the banter would happen like this. Well, the ethics guy's here. Well, the ethics guy's here? Yeah, the ethics guy's here. Oh man, do they need that in Washington. <laughs> Oh man, do they need that in business. And you could feel the railing against this story about how bad it was happening in the ethical world of America. Because as we know, Madoff had made off. <laughs> All right? Toyota yet had yet had to happen. The Lehman Brothers had. The story was just emerging. And so then I would get up. And I was the ethics guy. And here's the energy in the room. What does this tell you? Don't come at me with your ethics stuff. Don't tell me about what I need to know. You know, I got, I got what I need to know, and I know what I know. The prize been won, I got an A. So three times I did this, three out of 25, and by the third time, I was so incredibly bored with the energy that I was experiencing, walking into a room where the, pre the perception was that I was going to go at you with information to make you a better person. And I thought, you know, I don't want to do 22 more of these. And I began to wonder, well, how is it that I could frame the conversation that I was about to have, knowing that there was a predisposition about what ethics is. It's about the bad people that we got to corral, throw away so that the good people can show up. Well, guess what? That is so intellectually foul, incomplete. The story is that ethics is not that, and that I wanted to find out how do I communicate to people. So here's what happened. I asked people, uh, you know, before I start talking, I want you to think about, will you do this with me right now? Because if you do this, I can promise you, you will make the meaning of these, my four comments, to be very useful to you. Imagine there's somebody that you do, a company right now, you influence, you care about, you're, they're part of your life, they're happening at work, they're happening at home, they're happening in the community, and they matter to you, and you're bringing them in and you're letting them sit right beside you right now in your awareness. And that your conversation about your ethical journey is about the influence that you will bring to this person. All right? Now, what happened when I would say that at the beginning of the other 22 talks that I gave at Rotary? Here's what the energy was like after I said that. I am empowered. I can be with you. I bring something to the story of your life. I am there to accompany you. It was an entirely different engagement of people, simply because the reframing of the ethical journey was a reframing from ethics is a prize to be won to ethics is a journey to live. And that story is the story of our time. It is the journey of the ethical inquiry 
that is a movement of our life, not a prize that we win to decide who has it and who doesn't. And so, I'm going to present to you four lessons that I've observed are part of this accompaniment journey. And each of them is framed not only in a statement, but a question. And I'm going to describe them to you in the best way I know how from the viewpoint of how we really teach ethics. We teach it in a relationship. People come our way. The mentoring influence that Ian is describing to you is about people come our way and they give us information we need. The information we need stabilizes us. It helps us become who we must become. And therefore, we need people to come into our lives to be that stabilization. Not to tell people what they don't have, but to accompany them in the learning of what they can have. And we are that people. We are those people in our roles, no matter where our roles are, at home, at work, in the community, that's what our work is. So, the first lesson is this, the lesson of authenticity. And the lesson of authenticity asks a question. Are my personal and professional pursuits transactional or relational? Are my personal and professional pursuits transactional or relational? There are two ways that we look at our relationship with others. Either it's what I'm going to get from you or what I'm going to give from you. Transactional relationships diminish mentoring. They don't serve a useful purpose because they focus on what I'm getting, not on what I'm giving. 1960-61, I had two coaches. Storytelling to reveal to you when I learned this lesson and how it became engaged in my life. I'm a 14-year-old in high school. So I have two coaches that, that to year. In the fall, Coach Bob is my cross-country coach. In the spring, Coach Bob, a different Coach Bob, is my track coach. Coach Bob in the fall has been at Arcadia High School for years, and he is producing year after year after year championship teams. I just wanted to hang out with my buddies. I was no good at cross country. I just wanted to be with my buddies. But guess what? What I learned about Coach Bob in the fall was this. Before we did anything to become a championship team, he sat down with us every time we met. He sat down with us. And he asked us, so how's it going at home? What's happening? How's it going to school? Got any problems? His agenda was, what's going on with you before I want to tell you what's going on with us? He had such powerful clarity about his intention to make sure that he was interested in the life of another before he was interested in the transaction of what he, want, what he wanted from us. And I can tell you, this guy produced results big time. Continued to do so. By the way, Coach Bob just died at age 94 in January. Now let me tell you about Coach Bob in the spring. Olympic athlete, went to the 1960 Olympic Games. Extraordinary athlete. What I learned being on his team in the springtime, in the first year that he was coaching at Arcadia High School was, he wanted you to know one thing. Anything that you knew you could do, he could do better. And it didn't matter whether it was shot putting, running the 440, didn't matter whatever the task was out on that field, he made sure that everybody knew that he was just a little bit better than them. It was all about Bob. Bob lasted three years, he was gone. He didn't produce anything. He didn't build anybody up. It was all about me. And so if you look at the ethical journey about, I'm just got it all figured out and I need to tell you what you need to know, is about as dumb as you can get when it comes to the ethical journey. Your journey of authenticity, authenticity says born in the original. It means to be shaped by that which is the beginning. And here's what I know about the beginning. Life emerges from giving. The whole proposition of our life energy is about the energy of our giving. It's not about the energy of our getting. And so the accompaniment of authenticity 
is about an energy of giving. Lesson of continuous performance. What kind of person do I choose to be at home, at work, and in the community? The lesson of continuous performance has to do with a whole world of exploration about what's called character performance. I left you a card that gives you some insight about what character performance is with the ethical asset. Let me tell you about Howard Gardner. You may know about him. Professor of Cognition, Harvard University, wrote a book in 1984 called Frames of Intelligence. In this book, he was exploring how does the mind think. In 2007, he was interviewed by Harvard Business School, just at the front end of what was at just about a thing for better to break. And he was asked, so what's the update on the uh, frames of intelligence? How does the mind think? And Gardner wrote this. He says, I now can give the name to the highest level of how the human mind thinks. I can give it a name, and I can describe it behaviorally. He says, the highest level of thinking is the ethical mind. And the ethical mind behaves, it acts, it does. That's what behavior, that's what ethics is all about. It's what you do, not what your intention is. It's about what you do. He said, the ethical mind behaves in a very specific way. It asks the question, what kind of person do I choose to be at home, at work, and in the community? And will I place myself in alignment to an ethical mind that is always journeying to be an ever-growing influence at home, at work, in the community? The ethical mind is a mind in pursuit, not a mind that arrives. It is a practicing mind. I learned about this mind from Mrs. Best in 1958. Fifth grade, Mrs. Best was the best. Mm -hmm. You talk about an ethical person. You talk about a person who knew how to accompany. You talk about a lady that set the mark in my mind of what it means to men. And Mrs. Best was my lady. I was so lousy and Matt couldn't believe it. Mrs. Best had this thing that we did every Friday called your multiplication table. Now, in, and now they do the multiplication tables in second grade because my wife teaches second grade, and that's what they do. Fifth grade is when we were doing multiplication tables. So you came up on Friday, here was your chart, there's Russ, one through 12. All right? And let's say it's the forest tables this week. Here's the, here was the game with Mrs. Best. You came up, she was there. Oh, Russell, so good to see you. What are you doing today? I'm doing the forest tables today, Mrs. Best. Now, I probably did the forest tables three other times, but again, I was there to do the forest tables, because here was the story. You had to run the table on the forest tables. One times four is four, two times four is eight, three times four is 12, four times four is 16, four times five is 20, four times six is 25. Oh, Russell, four times six is not. 25, why Russell four times six is 24. <laughs> Russell screwed up again. Why Russell, you know the story. Why you know next Friday, you're gonna be up here again. And Russell, you know that there is a plan for this. And Russell, you know the plan because you've been working the plan. The plan is achievable. You want to do this, Russell. It is controllable because it's in your wheelhouse, Russell. It is challenging because you haven't done it yet. It is desirable because you want to get it done. And it is measurable because you're going to put an X through there. Russell, you can do it. That was Mrs. Best. She gave me not the sense of failure, she gave me the sense of accompaniment. And she didn't tell me that I wasn't capable, she told me that I could learn the skill that I needed to learn. Footnote on Mrs. Best, 25 years later. I know she's retired. I happen to go see her. I've not seen her since I graduated from sixth grade. 25 years later, I go up to her door, Golden West and Arcadia. She, I knock on the door, I know she lives there, she opens the door. Here's what happened. Why, Russell's so good to see you. <laughs> 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 
incredible. You talk about accompaniment. You talk about the value of your lives, it's because you have the capacity to accompany people that way. It is absolutely incredible. We do not understand the power of that influence. But we have, each of us has it. We have that influence for good because as Gardner said, the ethical mind does rest in us and we must find it to become a practical application in our daily life. And so, what I learned about this story about continuous performance is a basic lesson about the ethical journey. Think about it. We fail into success in our ethical walk. We fail into success in our ethical walk. And we must have principles to allow us to walk in the direction knowing that we fail. We can succeed, but we must have, as Mrs. Best taught me way back when, we must have a plan for when we fail. And she gave me great insight for me to understand that one of the skill sets of the ethical journey called performance character is to know you have a plan when you stumble. I learned a few others along the way that became part of my understanding about what performance character is about. If you want to know more about feeling empowered about who you are as an ethical citizen with the millennials that you heard about. Come on. Can you feel the sense of who you are as an influence for good around this generation that you're going to be coaching to, to take the baton? You are not inconsequential, and chaos is not the atmosphere of your leadership. The lesson of just this once. When can I take a break from what I stand for? That's the question. When can I take a break for what I stand for? Clayton Christensen is, uh, teaches at Harvard Business School. He's one of the beloved professors at Harvard Business School. So much so that the students that are graduating usually want him back to give a last seminar to them. He's created the last seminar. What he's discovered since 1979, as he brings back these graduates over the years that come back, he's learned something about top, you know, talking about the cream de la cream of the leaders in American business life. Many, 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 he discovered, come back unhappy, estranged, divorced, alienated from their families, lost. What it is that causes us not to keep the purpose of our life at the center of our life? And he, he, he addresses this question, how do you keep the purpose of your life at the center of your life? And listen to what Christensen says now to students. He says this, it's easier to hold your principles 100% of the time than it is to hold them 98% of the time. How could that be? It's easier to stay on target with who you are 100% of the time than it is to just go to sleep 2% of the time. How do we draw the line for what we stand for? So let me go back to 1960 when I learned the lesson of what I stood for. And though I have failed at the expression of this, I have never drawn a different line from that moment in 1960. My friend Don and I went to the football game on the first Friday night at Arcadia High School when I'm 14 years old. And Don and I get out of the car and Don says, let's jump over the fence and get in free. Uh, sure. How many you know who Howdy Doody is? Oh, Not many of you, do you? Come on, guys. Come on. You don't know, remember Buffalo Bob? Clarabelle. Well, Clarabelle. Well, anyway, Howdy Diddy was a show. Howdy Diddy was a okay. <laughs> mannequin, you know? Dummy. That's what I was at this very moment. When Don said, let's jump over the fence, I jumped. Don't mind here, just empty. <laughs> Buffalo Bob had control of me. His name was Don Walters. Let's jump, let's jump. Over the fence we go. And next morning, I'm sitting there around the coffee, uh, the table in, the, in my uh, home. 
I'm feeling undoubtedly uh, I made a mistake the night before. Meaning the line I cross. So Dad said, I say to Dad, hey, guess what I did last night? I jumped over the fence, got a creek. Dad looks up at me. Dad says, next week you pay double. That's all he said. Next week you pay double. All week long, I'm trying to figure out, what am I going to do to pay down double? How do I pull this off? So I just thought it was a money deal, a transaction. Come up next Friday night, game time, bring my money, drop it in front of the lady at the, uh, to get my ticket. And as soon as she sees the money, she says, my son, you've given me too much money. I now could consider this Anderson 360. As far as I'm concerned, the whole world is now prevailing upon this moment and it's being transmitted all over the world. Because I have found out this is not about money. This is about my life. And I just got caught. And I get to show up or I don't. So here's what I did. I looked at the lady and I said, I gave you exactly what I owe you. Never forget that. Here's what it meant. Here's what it means. Here's what I've pursued. Here's what I've taught. Here's how I've mentored since that point. I am responsible for my thoughts, my feelings, my action. Nobody else takes ownership of those than me. I need to understand that my thoughts, my feelings, my actions are mine. And that sometimes it's the toughest lesson of all to take ownership the thoughts, feelings, and actions that we have, but that's my job. You want to be a, a millennial guide to a feeling-based feeling generation that is going to discover along the way that feelings do lead to right thinking. There is perennial wisdom that exists, and feelings do lead to right thinking. And one of the greatest lessons of right thinking is I am at the center of the choices I make with my life. And those, that, that thinking is the powerful axiom through which we can move and maneuver through very turbulent times that will be upon us in the next 15 years. That lesson must be taught. I am responsible for my thoughts, feelings, and thoughts, actions, and feelings, and my feelings can lead me to right thought. There's your work as a teacher and a guide and a mentor. The lesson of short-term versus long-term gain. What is the critical skill in being an agent of trust in a distrustful world? What is the critical skill? The whole fulcrum of ethical life rests on a story of short-term versus long-term benefit. All ethical issues play themselves out on how we perceive short and long-term gain. If you want to simplify the story of what you want to understand about ethical inquiry at this most fundamental level, it's that lesson. And therefore, you need to understand what does it mean to gain long-term trust in a relational-driven world that you are creating. Long-term trust is the goal to sustain individuals and organizations, to sustain families, communities, businesses. You don't create long-term gain without trust. There's a tremendous amount of trust research that's been done right here in Orange County by the DGWB Values Institute. It's doing work with the business school here and will continue to do so. Over the last two years or three years, the Values Institute has done research into this theme of how is trust understood. Let me define the five assets of trust and go into the biggest one of all. All of these elements of trust are all considered essential variables in the exploration of the last 60 years of research on trust. So when you're hearing me describe these to you, it's not Russ giving you some good ideas. This is research-based information on the themes of trust. There are five variables. Two hard assets, three soft assets. The two hard assets are do I have an ability, a competency? Its corollary and second asset of trust is, do I deliver it with dependability? 
So do I have a core asset? Do I deliver it with dependability? Those are the two R's, hard assets of trust. The two soft assets, the affective side of the deliverability of, of your capacity and consistency are these three. Do we share in a common identity in our relationship with each other? A common value statement. Do we have a sense of sincerity about our communications with each other? All of those are high correlations of trust. They pale to insignificance with the last one. This is the one you want to hear. This is where the mentoring all happens. The highest correlation of trust has to deal with the theme of concern. Concern means the emotional factors related to caring, feeling, empathy, and tolerance. Meaning all five of those are very significant. The most significant is caring. The capacity to show concern. Think about that as an emotional story. When your kid stumbles and falls, or as my grandkid did the other day, jumped out of her um, bed for the first time, her crib, her mother found her and called my wife and said, what do I do? Do I tell her she did a wrong thing or do I tell her, do I pick her up first? Well, <laughs> mom said, pick her up. <laughs> Talk to her later, pick her up. <laughs> Concern is about our relationship with our journey with others around the tough issues of life. Trust is the variable that causes us to move in relationship around the tough issues. Do you want to create long-term gain with others? Shape trust, understanding that accompaniment with concern pales, I mean, excuse me, has greater significance than your capacity your skill set and the reliability of your skill set. Another way of saying that is leaders, your skill set is not your ace. Where did I learn this? John Wooden. He is a great man. In 1996, my foundation got to honor Mr. Wooden at an event, there's 700 people over at the, uh, the Grove in Anaheim. So John spoke for about an hour, and then we had an award presentation. And we gave Mr. Wooden his award. Who was there that night was his whole family, including his 67-year-old daughter, Nan. This time, John was 95. If there's one thing we know about Mr. Wooden, in terms of his professional accomplishment, he was always interested in the long-term relationship of who he had with him as a, a tremendous athletes. His interest was not simply to win championship. His interest was to build people. So now let me take you back to that night. He's getting his award, and he starts talking about how appreciative he is about his father. And then he starts talking about his family. And then he starts talking about Nan. And he says, you know, Nan, I've been working, been concerned about something with you. Now, I've been thinking about something we need to be working on now. And he starts talking about what we need to be working on. And Nan's 67 years old. <laughs> and 700 people are now in this conversation about John concerned about something he's wanting to work. He's very caring, but he's concerned about what he's wanting to work on. And it was absolutely a stunning understanding of the DNA of trust. He wasn't putting her on target so much as he was just saying, I love you so much, and I'm walking your way. All the time, 100% of the time. And so, there you go. Lesson of authenticity, lesson of continuous performance, Lesson of just this once and lesson of short versus long term gain. What do they have to do with in terms of uh, our ethical journey? 
How many of you remember Johnny Appleseed? Oh, please. Come on, who knows Johnny Appleseed? <laughs> Take a look at all the ones that don't. Who doesn't know Johnny Appleseed? Let me just see the hand. You can. You were I, there? I, I won't make fun of you. You were there? All right, so Johnny, Johnny, <laughs> did, Johnny did what, gang? Planted Appleseed. He planted Appleseed's doing what? Walking across Ohio, right? Casting those seeds. So if I was going to put a big bow around the four lessons of living with integrity, integrity and pursuit of accompaniment, what would I know about the Johnny Appleseed story? Meaning, why did Johnny cast the seeds? Does anybody have any idea? Anybody have an idea they just want to say? Why do you think he cast the seeds? He had deals to with the farmers to produce Applejack for the uh, liquor that they drank back in the Very day. good. He had franchising deals. So he had franchising deals. So he had some contractual things. Any other reason? Government subsidies. Government subsidies. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, this is a question my dad asked uh, people in the 1950s when he was working in the life insurance world physicians. He'd bring them in for their 10 a.m. appointment with life. If they bought on that, he'd really have them. <coughs> they'd come in, sit down, he'd tell the Johnny Appleseed story, and he'd ask the question, so why did Johnny cast those seeds? And I can tell you, my dad told me, it was about 25 years ago, my dad said, nobody had a clue. And then my dad would say this, absolute gold shapes my understanding of who I am, it's in my wheelhouse. It's in your wheelhouse. It is the call of the human spirit. It makes us be what we are in the, as the great human species that we are. It is the great hope. Here it is. Don't forget it. Why Johnny cast those seeds that we, so that he might plant trees under the shade of which he would never sit. Our work home, work in the community. Our work is to do that. To plant trees under the shade of which we shall never sit. To cast the vision of our life in such a way that the outcome of good that will happen will outlive us because we were clear that that was what we were accomplishing. Mrs. Best is a perfect example of that. John Wooden is a perfect example of that. The story of our life is to understand that our life is larger than our years. Our life is our relationship that we pass along because we become the one that came somebody's way to pass along the information. And the information that we will pass along is that there is perennial wisdom, wisdom that can help us get through, and wisdom that can move us as a society somewhere that is good, that we can help the next generation move forward. The call of the human spirit invites us to be that people. It's not HR work. It's not compliance work. It's not having the right rules. I can tell you what it is. It's understanding yourself and realizing that the power of one is power. I have no doubt that each of you can feel clearly at the center of your life influence when you say, I get to be the one who is that Johnny Appleseed the one who gets to pay it forward, utilizing my influence for good in ways that can bring good to a society that shall outlive me. And so with that, I don't think Bill's here, but he and I can play games, I guess, in yes, conversation. <laughs>
they're delaying uh, a lot of the things that were accomplished much earlier in life. And so there's a disconnect in terms of expectations. Uh, and I found that in my own family. I'm not living up to the standards of the previous generation, but that's not attainable in, in many ways. And then uh, this past week I was in Washington, D.C. and I walked by a bunch of uh, Occupy Wall Streeters and I happened to have Steve Jobs under my uh, arm and I said, so I asked him, well, what do you do? Well, we're against evil capitalism. And so I said, well, um, how do you feel about this guy? He goes, he's our hero, <laughs> Steve Jobs. <laughs> and I said, uh, why? He said, well, he created the viral world and the virtual world and, and everything that we can do to, to do this. I said, this man was one of the most vicious capitalists you've ever imagined in your life, uh, along with Larry Ellison and, and Bill Gates. Uh, their, their capitalistic uh, tendencies, which created this uh, miracle that you go by and you worship him for, uh, is uh, the antithesis of what you're you support. So those are the kind of disconnects and understanding that I've run into and, and maybe speak a little bit about uh, how, how, you, how you bridge the gap in terms of perceptions because we come from different yeah. worlds and we collide. A friend of mine wrote the uh, Managing the Millennials. From, yeah. And uh, so if you want to, I, both of you touched on the subject. Yeah, I, I'd speak to two things. The first is I would say uh, just in terms of the age gap because I think that's a significant uh, part. Um, one of the features of the millennial generation that I didn't mention, but that is really unique, is that it's the most intergenerationally open uh, generation in the last 60 years in American history. The slogan of the youth in the 60s was, don't trust anybody over 30, okay? Uh, so the millennials- But then we aged. Then you aged. Right? <laughs> I'm falling. Uh, so uh, they, they, they don't trust anybody over 30, right? Well, the, actually what's happened within the millennial generation is, they've had a great relationship with their grandparents. Yeah. So their grandparents have been a mainstay in their, their life. So what's interesting, Jet, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, here's just a quick little story. Um, Jet Propulsion Laboratory was having a problem with the millennial uh, employees and the boomer employees. You put your boomer employees. And they're like, why are they not getting along? Why are they not working together? And the problem was the Gen X employees were poisoning the well in the minds of the Gen Y employees about the boomers. Because huh. the Gen X didn't like the, the boomers for some reason, right? Because, you know, whatever. They're the body piercing generation. So, uh, so what JPL did was an internally mentoring system that intentionally partnered boomers mm -hmm. with Gen Ys in terms of an internal mentoring structure. And when they did their reviews at the end of the year, more than sal there was they were one of the questions they were asked if you had to choose between a five to ten piece, uh, percent pay increase every year um, that would take away this program because we'd have to pay you more money or keep this program and your salary would stay stable for the next five years what would you choose 99 percent said that they would rather choose the mentoring program so so just the, the, there's a context there that there's this internal mechanism so that's my first point as to the kind of the um, second, meaning the way that we go about those kind of conversations is we, we build strategic relationships and have conversations. The, with the Occupy Wall Street, uh, I think it's a good phenomenon, and I, I don't want to speak into the political nature of it, of how the virtual viral community can mobilize people to action. Uh, but I do think it's also a great illustration of that it's the, uh, it's the image of a movement versus the movement itself that's the motivating factor. Does that make sense? In philosophy, it's called a simulacrum. I don't know it's a fancy word. But what it means is it's, it's, it's the hologram of the real, right? And so what you're exposing is the real. And I think the only way that we can expose those relationships is through relationships, meaning it takes time to read. And 140 characters doesn't take time to read. Yeah. So you know about Steve Jobs. You know about the work in China. You know about all these things because you've actually read that behemoth book. They have it. The only way I say it is that we can have negotiating conversations is by building strategic relationships. Uh, intergender relationships that offer perspective. And I would say there's hope there because the millennials do want the perspective. Uh, I think it is on the onus particularly of the older generation though to start to reach out in some ways. And th that's my thought, but I don't rest with you. Thank the you. The issue to me in a lot of this, Boomer, have we not talked well? There's things, um, setting, and maybe it's not as much teaching as it is setting the example. Yeah. Young people get lectured, and it goes in one ear and out the other. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And young males are even dumber. <coughs> okay. Up um, to a certain point, then they 
past me. Yeah, I've told my class that the dumbest thing on God's green earth is the American male between 18 and 29. We're just yeah. all males. I don't care what generation. We're just, <laughs> it's amazing we live. Um, yeah, we're indestructible between bungee jump and parachutes and yeah. you know drinking. I sometimes wonder, but uh, is it that we have not set the example or taught the proper ways? Because like some of my students when I teach, you know, all right, Dad, give me, or my son, give me a lecture, Dad. And uh, then, you know, let me talk about GM, let me talk about the banking industry, let me talk, Dad, the more you guys screw up, the more money you make. So you want to give me a lecture? What do I tell them? Okay. And it's been one that, um, it's been hard for me to deal with and hard for me to, yeah. uh, how do we get it across? Because my generation was taught things like by what your Kipling gift, you know, your father telling you this is what you will do. You know, uh, the standard was, you know, especially for men being taught things, it was a lot different back then. You know. Today, um, I don't know how to get that across in some things. But yet, at the same time, I've seen like my son was a Marine, he came back from Iraq, went there at 18. And He's come back and he is still thinking of first time. And so it's different. And my class said, uh, I asked my class, you read uh, Steve Jobs? Yes. Well, did you know about China? No. Well, go look up China. <laughs> Five minutes later, I got 50 things up on the board where they're Googling. But they don't seem to be aware. So like, we're not teaching. I don't know how to teach them. I really don't. I mean, I have a quick thing to say, Brett, but the rest of you, if you want, uh, one of the things I would say is just about kind of like, like in my line of work, I'm a minister, 50 years ago, if I, if I was like, came into a plane or sat down and said somebody, I said, hey, my, what do you do for a living? I'm a minister. Uh, that I, it would be this over, I mean, oh, wow, really, you're, now they're like, yeah, can I get out of the seat? The you know, yeah, <laughs> because there's these assumptions, uh, I mean, there's lots of bad press, right? And so I would say the only way that we get good press is by good people embodying good press. And I would say that's the same thing for corporations. So like my generation, yeah, they make these big universal statements. Oh, all capitalism's wrong. Look at Enron. Look at, I mean, you know, look at the bailouts, all this stuff, right? I would just say they need relationships with people who've been doing good things for years who embody that. And that takes time. It doesn't take time just to flash a thing on the screen and say this is evil. So that would be my first thought. Hey, uh this, I'm Jeff Black from McDermott and Bullet Deck Research, and I have a question for you, Russ. Because you're talking about, we're talking a lot about the mentorship of younger people, but everybody in this room who isn't a millennial still needs mentorship. Yeah, that's good. And Russ, I know you have, you put a lot of focus on helping folks with what you call a clarity conversation, which is about mentorship for all of us that still need it. So how, how can we translate what we're talking about in terms of how to help millennials Help us as well. Uh, maybe that'll make us more well, the, help. The, the, um, just as a comment regarding feelings and did we screw up? And, you know, what's how do we gain clarity? There's a whole body of research now that suggests we we learned something and we taught something. Our generation taught the kids that feelings-based understanding is what's true. Mm -hmm. Who I am is the are the feelings that I have, and if I'm going to register. Uh, the, the who I am, it is found in that intuitive sense of feeling, the feeling, all right? I distinguish deeply between intuitive and feeling. Feeling leads anywhere, intuition leads to something very clear and transparent. Most of us are just fighting with dealing with the content of our life. We're hearing about the millennials completely confused by the content of their life. Well, guess what? We are living in a content of craziness. And that craziness that is the content of this time needs to have some clarity that sees beyond the content of confusion. That which happened in 2008, which moves forward for literally several years now, it will move forward. We will see the evidences of the shifting of how this feelings-based story plays out into stories of entitlement that will place us once again one against another. We will see this happening. And it will be difficult. And so when we're talking about the idea of conversation, 
the conversation that we have to do deal with is do our feelings lead us somewhere besides just living in the feelings all right the disintegration of societies occurs when the feelings govern the directions of society that is the choice making that are that we have now we could possibly see a society become more and more fractured as constituencies here and there say to us my feelings are the feelings we all should have Good. all right that will create chaos so is there truth in feelings if it's leading to right action if it's leading to thought that brings clarity and my sense is this my belief is my knowing is that we need a we need a marshalling Jeff of mentorship that will not take position but will dialogue right not dialogue from I've screwed up dialogue from let's company let's move with each other let's not perceive ourselves as failed let's look at ourselves as growing and moving together can I end this with a comment since I got the floor <laughs> All right. He's got the floor, he's got the mic. Yeah, I love this. And we'll end it there. The chieftain saw it was his time to pass the leadership to another generation. He brought his three daughters to him to say, Daughters, it is time to pass the legacy to one of you. Go upon the great mountain and find from the great mountain that which is story about future and so the three daughters went upon the great mountain on the first day the first daughter came back and said why well, father I went upon the great mountain where the Greenlands and the highlands meet the granite and I saw these beautiful beautiful flowers and they represent the beauty and the fragrance of our people father I bring back the story of our beauty oh father oh, oh daughter thank you for this gift from the great mountain the second day passed Second daughter returns, says, Father, I went upon the great mountain and I saw where the green meets the granite. I saw the lovely flowers, Father. I went where the granite is only there. Father, I brought back this stone from the great mountain that represents the strength of our people. Oh, daughter, thank you for this gift from the great mountain. The third day passes and the third daughter returns, Father, I went upon the great mountain. And Father, I saw the beautiful highlands and I saw the beauty of our people. I went further and I saw the strength of our people in the stone. But Father, I went all the way to the top of the mountain. I went all the way to where I could see. And what I saw, Father, was I saw a place that our people had yet to go. That place that is there. I saw that place, Father. And that place is the place that our people have yet to be. And it is our place. And we shall move and become that people. The father places his hand upon the right shoulder of the daughter and says, Daughter, lead our people. Mm -hmm. That is the collective energy of our time. To come into this chaotic sense and allow ourselves to know that we are both shapers and followers, we're learners and leaders. That is our work, and it's not role-driven, it is self-driven. It is the power of one multiplied in our work, in our homes, in our communities, because that vision, I believe, is a vision of our time, and it takes courage to walk and see that. And so with that, we'll conclude. Thanks. Thank you, Russ, and thank you, Ian, for uh, two very thought-provoking presentations. Um, that, was, uh, that was a great start to the conference, and, and we really do appreciate uh, you kicking us off like this.